The scripture reading today is Matthew 9, 1 to 12. Matthew 19, 1 to 12, sorry. Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read from him who created them from the beginning, made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man and his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. Why male and female? Why? Why male and female? Last week we dove into the question of what. What is a woman? What is a man? And this week we're going to continue the discussion by moving from what to why. Why is a man? Why is a woman? Why male and female. So if you weren't with us last week, then I ask you to watch on YouTube, go to the church website, or download onto your favorite podcast player, and listen to last week's sermon, because that's going to give you the full context for what we're continuing to teach on this week from this very important passage. Last week, we logically and biologically deconstructed the folly of believing the idea that gender can somehow be divorced from biological sex. And we began to unfold a historical and biblical anthropology understanding of humanity. And last week, we established from Jesus' words and from the Genesis creation account that whatever maleness and femaleness are, we find that they're from the beginning, that they're part of the very creation of the world, We find that they're binary, they're unquestionably male and female, and that it's intrinsic to our biology. It's not located in our feelings, but maleness and femaleness is located in our bodies, in our biology. And I closed last week by making the claim that from the very beginning, God created a binary of male and female, and it's part of our biology, and it's all for a purpose of beauty. It's all for a purpose of beauty. And that's what we're going to talk about last week. The beauty of why God created us, male and female. So why male and female? Friends, the answer is what we're going to look at and discuss today. The beauty of marriage. Now, sadly, we are going to have to address the question of the dissolution of marriage, of divorce. But friends, we're going to have to get to that next week. Because we can't discuss divorce until we understand marriage, just as we could not come to this discussion today of marriage unless we understood male and female. They all build on one another, and I really wanted to preach all of these concepts together in just one sermon, but I felt like none of you wanted to be here for three hours. You're welcome. So instead, it's going to be a three-week series on this key passage 
that asks and answers these questions. What does it mean to be male and female? What is marriage? And what happens when marriage is broken? And so let's consider today's passage. We know that the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they've approached Jesus with a question about divorce, which is what we'll talk about next week. But listen to Jesus' foundation. Listen to the the rationale, the foundation that Jesus lays before he even gets on to talking about divorce. And that is in Matthew 19, verses 4 through 6. He says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. And he said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now, I just want to start by pointing out that here, Jesus appeals to the Old Testament scripture as an authoritative word from God. And Jesus declares that the pattern of male and female as established in the creation and taught in God's word was authoritative then and is authoritative now. Jesus is quoting for us today from the very first book of the Bible, from the book of Genesis and Genesis chapter 1. And he says, Genesis 1 reveals to us God creating the world. And friends, if we were to read through Genesis chapter 1, the thing that would stand out to you is that God creates the world by making a series of related and yet complementary pairs. God separates the light from the darkness. He calls the light day and the darkness night. He separates the waters below from the waters above, and he creates the sky and the land. God separates the land from the water, and he creates dry land and sea. These things complement one another. They go together as parts of a whole. So we have heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land, or a day. A day has both night and day, darkness and light, sun and moon. They're corresponding parts of a whole. And when we reach the pinnacle of creation in Genesis chapter 1, on the sixth day, what we find in the text is that the narrative slows down. If you read the first part of of Genesis 1, it's kind of staccato. He's kind of just going through it. And then we reach the sixth day in the creation of humanity, and it it slows down. It actually becomes poetic. As God gives us another pair of distinct yet related parts. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Friends, this is an amazing passage, and as I mentioned last week, this is one of the only creation accounts of woman in Near Eastern creation myths. This is definitely the only account that declares that women are equally created in the image of God as man, because most other ancient creation myths treated women as defective or broken men. But no, no, we hear that women are equally created in the image of God equally valuable, and we find their creation right here, given to us in Genesis chapter 1. Male and female equally created in God's image, and they're a matched pair. Male and female, they're similar, and they're related, but they're no more interchangeable than the sun and the moon are interchangeable. They're no more interchangeable than dry land and the water are interchangeable. In fact, many scholars believe that the ceremonial law that God gave Israel emphasized and regularly reminded Israel of the separations and distinctions that God established in the very creation. And whenever a separation or a distinction was transgressed, that was unclean. For example, in the Torah or in the law, it goes to great lengths to emphasize the distinction between man and woman. And so we find the Lord command in Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. It says, A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. 
For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. Now, it's not saying that women can't wear pants or men can't wear pink. What it's clearly prohibiting, yeah, as Kevin wore pink today. Thank you, Kevin. I didn't even plan that with him. <laughs> what it's clearly prohibiting is dressing for the purpose of confusing, crossing, or interchanging the genders. And friends, while such activities were likely part of the sexual rites of all the pagan gods of Canaan, from which the Israelites were to stay separate, standing behind the prohibition even deeper is the fundamental truth that we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. That from the beginning, male and female were created different, distinct, and not interchangeable. So why male and female? Because of the beauty of marriage. Now, notice that immediately after declaring the binary of male and female, God gives the purpose for male and female in verse 28. Verse 28 says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Now, that is not a command that a man alone can fulfill. That is not a command that a female alone can fulfill. Just as it takes both light and dark to complete a day, by God's purposeful design, it takes both a man and a woman, a male and a female together to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The complementary nature of man and woman is further highlighted when we get to Genesis 2, because like we said last week, Genesis 1 is kind of the wide angle shot. It gives us the big picture of creation, the summary, and then Genesis 2 zooms in for us and gives us a more detailed account of the creation of humanity, which was the pinnacle of creation. And as we read last week, Genesis 2, 7 declares, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. So as we established last week, humanity is material. It's biological. We are embodied and given the breath of life. And after forming the man, it's, we read in Genesis 2.18, then the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make help fit for him. And we read in this account that God brought to Adam all of the different animals to name but it declares in verse 20 that for Adam, there was not a helper fit for him amongst the animals. Now again, twice, Genesis chapter 2 emphasizes this phrase, a helper fit for him. And a couple of things, the Hebrew word translated helper is ezer. And it doesn't imply inferiority or weakness because the same word is actually used to describe God in his relationship to us. Psalm 33 verse 20 says, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help, our ezer, and our shield. So you see, God didn't say, you know what, I should create someone to be less than and serve Adam, you know, to help him out. I'm going to create someone equal to Adam to serve with him. And the word translated fit in the Hebrew is neged, which means opposite or corresponding to or a mate. So Adam needed a helper who was different from, yet corresponding to him. And so Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 21, gives us the account of how the Lord accomplished that. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to man. And then the man said, this is at last the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So unlike all of the other animals which were said to have been formed from the dust of the ground, it says woman alone is formed from man's own flesh. So quite literally, the one flesh of humanity at the creation is said to be divided into distinct and corresponding parts. And so there's even a play on words that we miss in verse 23. It says, she shall be called Isha because woman was taken out of Ish. Ish, Isha, woman, man, night, 
day, dry land, sea, male and female are described as distinct and corresponding counterparts, two parts of the whole. And so we find in verse 24 that marriage is celebrated not as the union of two unrelated or random parts. Marriage is celebrated as the reunion of the one flesh that was divided at the creation. Male and female are two different yet corresponding parts made from and made for one another. Friends, man and woman, they fit. The two parts come together. It's not just a random union. It is a reunion to form the one flesh that was divided at creation. And friends, only that reunion can fulfill the command that God gave them to be fruitful and multiply. Now consider, friends, humanity, you, you have a cardiovascular system. And by itself, your cardiovascular system fulfills the purpose for which it was designed. You have a digestive system that by itself fulfills the purpose for which it was designed. You have a respiratory system that by itself fulfills the purpose for which it was designed. However, you have one system in your body that is unable to fulfill the purpose that it was designed for without a corresponding system. And that's the reproductive system. Man and woman were clearly made for one another. For they each have an incomplete reproductive system. And only when the two corresponding systems come together, only when the two become one flesh, can they fulfill the purpose for which they were clearly designed, being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth. So when scripture says one flesh, it's talking about the complementary biology of male and female that allows them to come together and procreate. It's talking about sex which produces children, which grows families. And friends, the foundational unit for any healthy and functional society are children living with their biological mother and father as God designed from the beginning. So why male and female? Because of the beauty of marriage. In fact, at every single wedding that I officiate, I begin by declaring this. The book of Genesis teaches us that God created us male and female and gave us marriage so that husband and wife may help and comfort each other, living faithfully together in plenty and in want, in joy and in sorrow, in sickness and in health throughout all their days. God gave us marriage for the full expression of the love between a man and a woman. In marriage, a woman and a man belong to each other and with affection and tenderness freely give themselves to each other. God gave us marriage for the well-being of human society, for the ordering of family life, and for the birth and the nurture of children. Friends, this is God's good pattern and design from the beginning. It is, it is binary, it's in our biology, it's for the birth and the nurture of children, and it's for the blessing of society. And friends, it's beautiful. Now, just because some male-female pairings are sterile or they choose not to have children, it doesn't diminish the truth of God's pattern or his design. Friends, exceptions don't unmake a rule. The good pattern that in general, when all works as it should, male-female pairs are fruitful. And when we understand, now we also understand, friends, that the pattern, the good pattern of male-female sexual coupling can be practiced in a sinful way. There's sinful practice that the Bible talks about. Male-female sex outside of marriage, adultery, pornography, trafficking, abuse. The good pattern of male-female sexual coupling can be practiced sinfully. However, the pattern of male-male or female-female sexual pairings it's always sterile, it's always unfruitful, and that pattern is never affirmed or celebrated in the creation account or anywhere else at all in all of Scripture. The pattern of male-male or female-female sexual coupling is intrinsically not good, whereas we find that the coupling of male and female is intrinsically good, both in pattern and in right practice. 
But neither in pattern and practice do we find male-male or female-female activity ever celebrated in the scriptures. As we saw in Deuteronomy 22.5, men and women are not interchangeable, and they shouldn't present themselves in a way that confuses, crosses, or interchanges the genders. So you can't just switch out one half of the male-female pairing for another. In fact, Leviticus 18.22 in the Torah, it says, you shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It's an abomination. Why? Because it's a violation not only of practice, but of the pattern. God says, from the beginning, I gave you a pattern, and it's male and female. And this is a violation not just in practice, but a violation of the pattern, and that's an abomination. In fact, in the book of Romans, the Lord spoke through the Apostle Paul saying that because of our human unwillingness to recognize the obvious truth that there is a God and to submit to him as God and to submit to his design, Romans 1.24 says, therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their heart, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Friends, to the lust of their hearts. It says God gave them up to the lust of their hearts. In other words, God says, you want to follow your heart? Do you want to be your true authentic self? Go ahead. And what does it look like? Romans 1, 26. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. And their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. The men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Because, friends, both the pattern and the practice of homosexual behavior is inherently sinful because it violates God's obvious and good design, which is the male-female binary from the very beginning. It's part of our biology, it's for the birth and nurture of children, it's for the blessing of society. So why male and female? Because of the beauty of marriage. And marriage is only between a man and a woman, the reuniting of the one flesh that was divided at the creation. Now, I'm aware that the United States Supreme Court decision in the Obergefell case in 2015 legalized homosexual marriage in this country. But friends, honestly, I don't believe they changed anything. They might as well have repealed the law of gravity. They might as well have tried to rewrite the constant of pi. Some things humans are powerless to change because they simply are. Marriage predates the main legislature. It predates the nation of America. It predates recorded human history because marriage just is I mean, friends, consider, there's no act of Jewish prudence or legislature or human will that can change the fact that the corresponding colors of blue and yellow make green. Can you change that by law or by will? Friends, if you substitute the yellow for another blue and you have blue plus blue, you'd never get green because some things simply are by the nature of their being. In the same way, the elements of sodium and chloride together make sodium chloride or table salt. However, if you substitute a second sodium instead of the chlorine and you have sodium and sodium, friends, no matter how you might desire, demand, or declare it, you will never get sodium chloride. You'll never get table salt because some things are simply by nature of their being. Only blue and yellow can make green. Only sodium plus chlorine makes sodium chloride, and only male plus female makes marriage. Now, every government has the right and the responsibility to author social relationships and contracts to protect the rights of its citizens. But friends, if we didn't create marriage, do we humanly have the power to change it and redefine it and expand it? Is that possible? And consider... If we disregard the clear and the obvious boundaries of biology when we define marriage, if we remove the science and the logic and the history of a male-female binary, then what are we left with to define marriage? Love is love. And how does that serve us? 
If we remove the biology and we simply say that we define marriage as love is love, then people will soon do whatever they want to. For example, if love is love and that's the only boundary, on what grounds would you limit marriage to just two people? Polyamorous and polygamous relationships should and must be included if love is love. And more than that, friends, if love is love, what about consanguine or blood relation marriage, such as the marriage of this adult daughter to her father, the father to whom she says she lost her virginity? Why shouldn't we celebrate that? If the way we define marriage is love is love, how about the marriage of an adult brother and sister? This article argues that incest is, in fact, a fundamental right. But if love is love, why not? And friends, if biology actually means nothing in defining marriage, then what about those who wish to marry animals, such as this woman who married her dog? If biology is meaningless and love is love, then how about those who wish to marry human-like dolls, like this man who is pictured here with his wife and with his mistress? He calls it synthetic love. And most frighteningly, friends, if according to our culture, our children as young as 12 and 13 can be so certain about their gender identity and sexual desires that we will give them hormones and surgery as young teens, why aren't those children also qualified to make decisions and engage in sexual relationships with whoever they love, their own age, or older than them? Because love is love, after all. Friends, not only are we powerless to redefine marriage, we discover that the common mantra of love is love fails us. It fails us as a reliable guide to define relationships, and it fails us as a reliable guide to protect the most vulnerable amongst us, especially our children. So why male and female? Because of marriage. Friends, it is from the beginning it's binary, it's woven into our very biology, it provides for the birth and nurture of children, and it's a blessing to society. Because friends, God's design is very good. You know what? Sociology, psychology, economics, and statistics all testify to the goodness of the male-female marriage for humanity and for society. In fact, all of these following facts about marriage are widely available from many sources on the internet. We know that marriage is good because first, marriage creates children. You know what? You can dismiss any myths that you hear about overpopulation because the U.S. fertility rate dropped to less than replacement level in 1972. And more than that, our economy here in America, we have borrowed extensively and are accruing a massive national debt that's supposed to be paid for by future generations. Well, a time is coming very soon when we will not have enough productive members of society to pay our debt or care for the elderly. And only male-female marriages have the potential to be fruitful and produce children and provide enough productive young people to contribute to society and care for the elderly. Second, marriage best raises children. Friends, children from marriage with a father and a mother are six times less likely to commit suicide, half as likely to become pregnant out of wedlock, and less likely to drop out of high school. While I've not yet read it, just last September, uh, just last September in 2023, the book The Two-Parent Privilege, How Americans Stopped Getting Married and Started Falling Behind, caused quite a stir, because how dare you? suggest that maybe there's some goodness in the design. But friends, science proves it. Third, marriage protects women. While abuse does happen in marriage, statistically, women in marriage relationships are less likely to face abuse and abandonment because women often give up or postpone their careers to have children and marriage provides protection from being abandoned and harmed economically by uncommitted men. Friends, marriage fourth civilizes men. Do you know that men are more likely to be employed? They cause fewer crimes and are less likely to be in jail because marriage causes men to grow up and take responsibility for someone other than themselves. 
And we are suffering with a generation of unmarried men who have no interest in caring for the women that they're sleeping with and no interest in providing for the children they create. And it's disgusting. Fifth, marriage benefits those who are married. Married people have better emotional and physical health than unmarried people. Married people live longer and are less likely to commit suicide than those who are not married. Married people have more satisfying and more frequent sex than those who are not married. And married people enjoy greater wealth than unmarried people. Marriage, sixth, lowers crime, poverty, and welfare. Children with a married father and mother are seven times less likely to live in poverty, half as likely to commit crimes, and are stronger academically and socially. Friends, that's just the tip of the iceberg. I could go on and on and on. I'm simply pointing out that science confirms what Scripture declares, that male and female are for the beauty of marriage, and marriage is for the blessing of society. And finally, church, a theological point. Why is the male and female binary essential for marriage? Because we discover in Scripture that marriage points beyond itself to something that is greater and something that is truer. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32, the Apostle Paul quotes for us Genesis 2, 24, the same passage that Jesus quoted for us. And then Paul goes on to make this statement. Verse 31, Therefore man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul tells us that marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. It's meant to point us to Christ's relationship with his church. Friends, marriage actually points beyond itself. The reunion of male and female is patterned after and a picture of the union of Christ and his church. So church, if you change the parts, you're going to change the picture. You can't switch it out and go, look, it's Christ and Christ. It's church and the church. No, it must be Christ and the church. And in the same way, if marriage is a picture, you can't just switch it out and go, look, it's man and man. It's woman and woman. That's a different picture. The picture is male and female for marriage. Male and female, Christ and his church, it's the mystery of marriage. And friends, in fact, the Bible begins by celebrating marriage. We saw all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, and it actually ends in Revelation 19, celebrating the marriage feast of the Lamb. When Jesus returns, it says that he's united eternally with his bride, the church, and Revelation 19 celebrates in verses 6 and 7, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Friends, the Bible begins and it ends with marriage. And in the middle, it repeatedly celebrates and reaffirms the goodness of the pattern that God created, male-female marriage. The meta-narrative of Scripture answers the question uh, unquestioningly, undeviatingly, and unchangeably, why male and female? Because of marriage. Now, friends, we confess that despite God's good design for marriage, we live in a world that's tainted by sin and by selfishness and by abuse. So what happens when marriage goes wrong? And that's what we're going to discuss next Sunday as we complete this study of Matthew chapter 19. However, as I conclude this week, I want to offer a reminder to those of you who are happily married, those of you that are unhappily married, and those of you who are unmarried and longing to be. And that word is, marriage is ultimately unsatisfying. Marriage is ultimately unsatisfying. As Christian author Rebecca McLaughlin wrote, like a sketch compared to the real painting, a doll to a real baby, a toy car to an actual Tesla, marriage at its best hints towards the greater reality. It's designed to leave us in some sense unsatisfied. 
Friends, what does that mean? The Apostle Paul said marriage is meant to be a picture that points beyond itself to a deeper and a truer reality. Friends, Jesus offers us what no husband, what no wife could ever offer. The relationship with Jesus can and will satisfy you like no human marriage, no human relationship ever will. Like I said last week, if you struggle with gender dysphoria, your salvation is not going to be found in gender euphoria. And friends, if you struggle with homosexual desires, your salvation will not be found in heterosexual desires. If you struggle with being single, your salvation will not be found in marriage. And if you struggle right now in a bad marriage, your salvation will not be found in a good marriage. And my friends, if you're in a good marriage right now, your salvation is still never going to be found in that relationship. Because even the very best of marriages will somehow leave us unsatisfied because, friends, nothing on earth can satisfy us. Only Jesus satisfies. Only Jesus saves. The mystery of marriage is meant to point us to our need for a union with Christ. The unsatisfaction that we find in even our best marriages points us to our need to find our ultimate and perfect fulfillment in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. So friends, yes, seek to be married. Yes, celebrate marriage. Yes, work to improve your marriage relationships. But look not to marriage. Look not to better sex. Look not to improvements in your marriage or to anything else to ultimately satisfy or to save you. Look to the bridegroom, to Jesus Christ, and invite him to make you, his bride, more beautiful and more ready for him and for his return. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the mystery and the beauty of what you've created, for the mystery and the beauty of marriage, and more than that, to what marriage points us to, which is the mystery and the beauty of Jesus Christ, who has come to be our bridegroom, who has come to make us his own. And Father, grow us. Grow us in our relationship with him. Unite us by faith to him. And may he be glorified in and through us, his bride, his church, now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.